Hello, and welcome to Questions with Hugh. This week, I thought I'd take the lazy approach and do a Q&A. Uh, scrap that. Uh, I thought I'd give massive value to my followers and answer the burning questions you have about me, my life, and my businesses. So here we are. So I put out the invite on my main social media channels. The handle on all three of those is at Hughes View. So if you want to follow what I do, I post more uh, regular and personal content on those. Uh, feel free to follow me. I've thankfully got loads of questions to answer here. So I'm just going to get stuck straight into it. And many people have actually done multiple questions. So uh, I will do my best to answer them honestly. Okay, so the first question is from Mark Tomlinson. Thank you for your questions, Mark. What advice would you give your 20 year old self? Or what advice would you give your 30 year old self. Well, as I've mentioned on this channel before, I was a total in my 20s. So I would say, uh, put down a drink, leave her alone and stop worrying about what other people think. I think mainly I was very insecure. I suffered with mental health problems as well. I was eating too much, drinking too much, didn't know what I wanted to do, felt a bit lost. So, you know, I'm not sure how much I would have listened. You know, I think it's probably worth putting that down as a starter. I got into a hole and I was so unhappy. Really, finances I know was a big driver for me. That really ignited something when I turned into my 30s. So I think if I could kind of speed that process up and would provide Hugh with the charts that I saw in my 30s, like the compound interest, you know, the, the benefit over time, what that does, the calculator, like in 30 years, this is what your money will look like. As well as, you know, looking back at the stock market returns over the last 10, 20, 50 years and being able to see that as well as house prices and how much they've gone up. I think that might have been enough to kind of stir something in me. If I'd been open enough to listen, I think I'd probably say, look, stay at home as long as you can. I was kind of desperate to get out whilst probably could have made the most of that as well as back myself and start more businesses, like try some stuff out while your overheads are so cheap. Uh, you know, you've got no responsibility, you've got nothing to lose. I remember one time I was at my weekly wage that came in, all I was doing was spending like 10 quid a month on uh, my phone bill. And that was it. That was literally all I had to pay. As well as I think 20 quid a week rent to live at home. So why don't I make the most of that? The other thing I suppose is environment, I think is really key. And I was around people that wanted to live for the weekend. So I, I don't know how I would have encouraged you to think of it differently, but really try to encourage him to go into an environment of like entrepreneurs and business people and investors. And I think I might have really tried to work hard to impress those people in my 20s when it was like important to me rather than trying to impress people getting pissed on the weekend. Number two uh, is uh, Mark's other question. What habits do you believe offer the biggest bang for your buck when looking to save money? For me, this is a bit more straightforward. I think tracking your income and expenses is crucial. I think that's probably the number one. I did this on a previous video as well about investing in seven years, but the multiply the annual expense by 25 is a really great way to decide whether or not that's worth it. So if you're paying 50 quid a month for something, find out what the annual expense, so in that case, 600 quid, and then you multiply 600 quid times 25, which I'm not gonna do with that calculator. Um, it'll be like 16 odd grand or something. Is that thing really worth 16 grand? And the reason that we do that is because multiplying by 25 is the equivalent of the 4% safe withdrawal rate for stocks and shares. So, you know, you need 16 grand invested in stocks and shares to afford this thing that's costing you 600 quid a year. Is it worth it? Um, so that is a very useful tool. What else would I say for saving money? I think just having fun with it. When you track your income expenses, for me, naturally, I just make it a game. Like, can I beat myself last month or last quarter? You know, if I'm living on a grand a month, and at one point I was living on under 830 quid a month, you know, can I beat that? Can I squeeze that down to 750 and just have a little fun with it? I think you'll be surprised at really how much fun that can be. Gamifying the system and maybe, you know, competing with a friend or your, your partner or even yourself just really helps to kind of keep it interesting. At least that's what I find anyway. Building your own business requires you to don many caps and work outside your chosen area of expertise. What are the best ways to overcome your own faults and when is the time to outsource? Oh, that is a good question. As a starting point, self-awareness is key. So do you know what your faults are? Uh, and at that point, then you can kind of question it. I think Gary Vee has said self-awareness is one of the greatest skills you can have. You know, I think it's hard to argue. So knowing what you're good at and what you're weak at is the first point. I think after that, it's probably a little bit more of a rational answer in that, how much is, are you actually getting paid for what you do? So as a, just a very generic rough answer, let, let's say you're on 50K a year, and let's say you work 50 out of the 52 weeks in a year. So you're earning roughly a thousand pounds a week. Now, if you divided that by say the average, say 40 hours, uh, that's gonna be, I think like 25 quid an hour. 
So what tasks in your business can you outsource for less than 25 quid an hour? So if like editing, for example, like that took me when I was doing it, like three days to edit. And I worked, you know, what my hourly rate is times three days. Like, Jesus Christ, like this is a lot of money that I'm spending for myself to do that. It's not worth it. So I went out and you know, try to hire an editor. And I just put the same thing back to you. If you're paid by the hour, that's even better. Like if you're 15 quid an hour and a job can be outsourced for 10 quid an hour, then outsource it. So I would say that's probably the best time to do that. The only other caveat I would add to that is if you are paying to outsource, make sure you're using the time that you've just saved to actually do the job that you're doing. Like if you just outsource everything and you're not adding value, um, you're not earning that 25 quid an hour or that 15 quid an hour doing that thing instead, it's kind of wasteful. You'll just be spending money, but I hope that answers your question. How did you start your business and what is needed to do so? So how did I start my business? Look, I just kept it all in my personal name to start with, just to make sure if this was gonna work. I had no idea whether this was garbage or not. So I did the publishing books, did a course in December 14, 2014, released my first book in January uh, 15. And then by the middle of the year, like June, July, I was earning a thousand pounds a month. And in my head, I thought that if I can bring it to around a thousand pounds a month then I'm gonna have to take this down the business route and that's when I looked at it so don't be worrying about doing anything to start with just is this legit like do I enjoy it like is it earning money is this worthwhile pursuing and then you can kind of focus on the creating a company side of things I think a lot of people are put off by that like they're worried about doing their accounts for the first time like I was I've never done a self-assessment before tax and all of those implications you know I know this is easy to say but when you're in a position you will say the same thing don't worry about that just get involved like get selling make money and it really isn't as complicated as you think it is. And the benefits far, far, far outweigh all the little things you've now got to learn and do. And there's loads of help out there. As far as starting, you just a business, you'd go to Companies House, you can do this online, you register your business name on Companies House, it's like cost 10 quid, 20 quid or something, it's not much at all. You then need to open a business bank account because you need all separate finances, which again, doesn't take long, it's like a matter of days and weeks to do that. And then it's really just tracking your incoming expenses, like what, what money have you spent on generating that business, how much you're getting back, and then you can start the steps of working with an accountant. You know, I'd also add this is why I think it's so important to be on top of your personal finances because I was doing all that for, you know, I think 2012 and 13, I started doing it. So in 2015, when I had my business, you didn't have to ask me or suggest do that. That's what I was doing. I was tracking everything and tracking all my investments, my personal finance. So this was a business, like how much was I spending? How much was coming in? And it made life so much easier. So I just like passed that over to the accountant. I knew that it was working as well because I was tracking my numbers. So just another emphasis on the importance of that. I just wanna emphasize that point again. Don't be bogged down by the fear of starting a business. Just get going. When you're starting out in your business, this is what I read, Ready, Fire, Aim by Mathis Matheson, I think. I can't remember his, Matheson, Matheson. I'll put it on the screen. But that book was suggesting that if you earn less than a million pounds a year, and I do, then you are a like a toddler business. You're brand new. And all you should be focusing on, or at least 80% of your time, should be sent, uh, spent on sales. Don't worry about the rest of it. So just get bookings, sell your product or services. 80% of the time, just be focused on that. All of the kind of office equipment, accounting, branding and stuff, that'll come. You know, I will use that 20% of the time. Just make sales and make money and the rest will sort itself out. Uh, what advice would you give for someone trying to start a side hustle? Uh, just get going. Don't overthink it. Uh, starting is crucial. Just get that momentum. The less asshole answer <laughs> to give you a little bit more than that would be whatever it is that you're doing, it's very unlikely that you're the first and best person doing that. There's someone that's probably been, been there and done that before. Who are they? Like find someone in a position that you like wish you were at and uh, model their behavior, like find out what they did. We're so lucky we've got the internet, we've got coaching programs, there are books, we can find all this stuff out. And I think one thing I will add here is that people are kind of put off with, oh, there's another guy like pitching a, uh, you know, a training program. What I've kind of learned to understand, I spend a lot of money, like five figures a year on training, and I'm very comfortable doing that because there are people that have spent, in some cases, decades learning stuff and they're putting the best of what they know, they're giving it straight to you. The amount of time that you save from that and therefore the money is unbelievable. I just wanna give a quick example of this because I spent 20 grand for a property course and people are like, what the are you doing? Like spending 20K? Like most people I know think that. 
And that's cool, you can think that. But the goal of the course was to earn 50 grand a year and to build a million pound portfolio. That wasn't a guarantee, that was just what they would push everyone to do. And roughly about 20% of the people do that. So if I could guarantee to you that you'd spend 20 grand and you'd have a 50 grand a year income and a million pound portfolio, would you do the course? So that's a different question. It's not a guarantee, but I was willing to take that bet and I backed myself. And hey, if I didn't do it in 12 months, then could I earn 50 grand a year or at least that sum back, that 20K back in two years or three years or 10 years? Like, of course I can. So stop dicking around with property and not knowing what I'm doing, making mistakes, doing things. Get in a circle with, some, with people that know what they're doing, uh, that are in the same boat as me. We can all help each other. And it was just a no-brainer decision. I've now got a million pound property portfolio. And once the third development is complete, which will be probably at the end of 2023, I think probably, like realistically, we may have somewhere between seven and nine grand a month coming in. Like, it's just an absolute no-brainer. So um, yeah, hope that helps. Which habit is your most sacred? Great question. For me, it's exercise. I read someone say that, and I love this, that exercise is a well-being tool and diet is a weight loss tool. I couldn't agree more. Like if like I'm a 39 now, I still work out multiple times a week. I enjoy it. I'm not in like amazing shape, but if you said that working out would never make me stronger, fitter, faster, more powerful, I would still do it because of how I feel from doing it. You, you are getting a weekly challenge, which is uncomfortable. So you're putting yourself in an, an uncomfortable position regularly and you're getting used to that pain and discomfort. So I think that's really good for us. But like most things that are painful and, and, and uncomfortable, it's at the end of it. I, I love the gym. I love the pump that you get and I love going through that. But the after feeling, when I come out of the shower and I'm ready to eat, it's just like... I couldn't care less about anything. I'm just in such a great position. So I would still work out even if I got zero gains from it. So exercise for me is just, it just helps my mind massively. Uh, I can vent frustrations on the weights. You know, I get to walk around outside in between sets, take in nature and stuff like that. There's a mindfulness to it. I can listen to podcasts and, you know, listen and learn during my workouts. And if you're working out with someone, which I don't do that much because of where I'm based, but when I did that, you've got the social element as well. So exercise without a doubt for me. How do you combat bad habits? Mark, you are smashing it with the questions. I love this. I read the book Tiny Habits by BJ Fogg and that's really stuck with me. There were two main things that he's recommended doing if you wanted to get rid of something bad. So for me, this was pigging out eating. Like I eat massive volumes. I'm quite a compulsive eater. And also drink. It's, it's you know, impacted me in my 20s and I probably had a, a slight drinking problem in my 20s, to be honest with you. I can't really have one or two drinks. Like if I start, like the Pringles, when they pop, like I don't stop. I want to get a buzz on, um, so that's not great. BJ Fogg recommends that you make it invisible. You get rid of that prompt altogether. So if there's no drink in the house or no snacks in the house, I'm not going to eat it. I'm not even going to think about it. But I tell you what, when Lou, because Lou doesn't have these problems uh, of overconsumption like me. So whenever she brings like a cake or makes bread or something is in the house and I see it and smell it, like I can't just want it. So we just try and have a rule. <laughs> it's like, so bad I've it, but she's hides it from me and she needs to because I will fucking eat it and I'll fucking eat it all right now. Packet of biscuits, terrible. I'll eat the whole thing. So I just don't buy biscuits and then I don't. I don't even think about it. Look, in some cases, you can't avoid everything and you have stuff like habits in your mind that you'll, you know, compulsively think about. So if you can't make it invisible, then make it really difficult or hard. Like a good example here is the phone. Checking your phone and social media. So if you do need a phone and you can't get rid of it altogether, then just make it more challenging. Don't put it there in arm's view, arm's view, in eye's view or arm's length. Take it into another room and allow yourself the opportunity to look at it later. Like what one extra step can you add to make it more challenging to do that thing? Another good one was logging out of social media, but not having an app. So you've got to log in every single time to check it. Like just that extra step, that extra annoyance might be enough just to stop you checking. Were you, <laughs> okay, Mark, thank you. Were you always ginger? And I can, can I please see a picture of when you had your longest hair? Look, I'm, Yes, I was always ginger when I had hair anyway, like like the bit, and it was this color as well, like bright orange. And my hair used to go outwards rather than down. Like I had, it was, uh, they used to joke like it was a fro. And one of my mates at uni pissed himself because I went, I was, we were swimming and I swam up and came back up and he just laughed. <laughs> and he was like, your hair is almost dry immediately. And I was like, yeah, I know. It's like, it's quite wiry hair. Uh, so I used to have like a ginger, 
bit of an afro, quite curly. Look, I'll, I'll show you now. I'll show you now the best picture I've got of me with with hair. But this is back in the day. I'm old, you know, 39. So I, I haven't got any. I haven't got that many pictures, and I think I've lost them and got rid of them. But um, yes, it's it's legit. And I wish I grew it longer, to be honest. Like I made the most of it. I went bald at like 22, 23. So yeah, not good. Okay, Julian Roque. I hope I hope I'm pronouncing your surname right there, Julian. You are an achiever. How do you stay focused to get what you want in life? Um, God, these are quite deep. For me, I just, I decide what I want and then I go and get that. Like, that is it, like mine made up. The advice I gave a little earlier, like I'll find out who's doing that. Like I wanted to be a property investor, right. Where are property investors? I find someone, do a course, hopefully build me towards earning a million pound portfolio and a 50 grand a year. I'm just gonna do it. I'll just chuck myself in there. So how do I f stay focused? I think being in that environment, deciding what I want and then setting a goal for myself and going out and trying to achieve that the best that I can. Like it might sound a little bit arrogant, but I've come to learn that as long as it doesn't violate the laws of the universe, like I believe it's possible. So unless it's like beating Usain Bolt, like that isn't gonna happen, but can you earn a million pound portfolio Portfolio. Can you retire in 10 years? Look, there are people out there doing it, so I can do it. There's no reason why they can and I can. I always have this caveat in my head as well that, you know, chasing a 50, you know, 50 grand a year income from property. Well, what happens if I fail and I get to say 25? Like, is that the end of the world? Like, no, and it's not a failure and that's okay, but I'm gonna go and pursue it and go for it and see what happens. Going for a million subscribers. There are other people doing that. You know, if they can do it, why can't I? That doesn't mean it's gonna be easy, but I'm gonna find out what they do and I'm just gonna emulate that, make it my own, and I'm not gonna stop until I get there. So it's as simple as that, really. And I just set myself little benchmarks and I, just, I, th I think belief is probably a, a big factor as well. I will add one thing. I think when we're answering these type of questions, you think about what, what are all the things that you can do? Like inverse the question and think about what not to do as well. It's a really powerful way of uh, finding solutions. And I think one way that will make it more difficult is focusing on too many things. If there is something you want, like really hone in on that and give it everything. Like I, I'm doing YouTube six days a week. So six, seven days a week. And then the rest is kind of fitting around. It's 80% YouTube for me. But if you want to do YouTube, build a property portfolio whilst holding down a full time, it, it, look, it, I'm not saying it's, it's impossible. You're just making it way harder for yourself. So how can you put more energy into that thing? How do you set goals and check that you're on the right track to achieve them? How do I set goals? I think I was, to be frank with you, I think I was way more anal about this back in the day and I've become a bit more loose. Consistency is everything. Like when it comes to success in the thing that you're doing. Therefore, I don't focus on the outcome goal of a million subscribers. I'm not obsessing about that. It's a target, it's something I'm going for. But what I'm focusing on is sitting down every single day from 5 a.m. or 6 a.m. till midday working on YouTube. So it's a process goal. As long as I'm doing that, then the outcome will take care of itself. So it's focusing on process goals that will help you work towards the outcome and not not obsessing about the outcome and just being consistent. Now, for those of you that are interested in something like YouTube um, or a side business and you're working full time, look, just do an hour a day. Get up an hour earlier, lunch hours, evenings, weekends, like dedicate doing something, but it's better to do a little bit, like 30 minutes to an hour every day than it is to do eight hours on once a week Saturday. Like, trust me, just a little bit every day is better than nothing. Okay, do you outsource or tend to do everything yourself? Yeah, good question. It's a mixed bag, actually, in all honesty. So I'll start my first business, which is publishing. So I was doing everything to start with, started outsourcing. I'm now at the stage where I've got two lovely ladies um, running that business for me, essentially. And then what I do is check in on a weekly basis. We set Ask on a Monday, we'll check in on Wednesday and then see how they've gotten on the Friday. I'm here to answer any questions or problems they have. They're very capable and good at what they do and they largely run that business for me. On the property business side of things, second business, I do that with my business partner, Martin. Martin's the guy on the ground. He he gets the development done, makes sure he's managing the team like on the ground and he finds the deals as well. So he finds them, helps us purchase and negotiate, then uh, does the transformation, like the crappy building to these lovely flats at the end. And I'm the money guy. So on that side, there's large chunks of work outsourced to Martin there. And I am still quite heavily involved with the finance side. So I pay all the bills, I track all the spending, forecasting, all of that type of jazz. I bring my own money to the table as well as investor money as well. So that's kind of like semi outsourced. I don't know if you say outsourced, we run it together. YouTube wise, I'm doing everything. 
apart from editing at the moment. So there's a lot more that I could outsource, but at the moment I'm not earning a penny with YouTube. Please subscribe, please like and comment and share. Uh, I need to get to a thousand uh, subscribers and have 4,000 watch hours to become monetized. So, you know, until that point I'm earning money, I'm not going to be spending huge amounts. I need to be mindful of the money that's coming out of this. So profits I'm getting from my publishing are kind of going into this at the moment until it kind of washes its own face. But um, yeah, hopefully soon I'll be able to outsource some more. Uh, this is a YouTube comment from Infinite Universe. So thank you for your question. If I had 10K, what should I do with it? For example, would it be stocks, business, buying houses, renting them out? I think uh, there was another question from Steve Crook, which was very similar along, along those lines. So first of all, if you've got consumer debt, you gotta get rid of that. So that doesn't include a mortgage. That just means like loans and credit cards, overdrafts. You've gotta hammer that first of all. Then you're gonna need a emergency fund. And I recommend just as a very, very base, like three to six months. So if you've got that in cash covered, then we can look at the next step. If you just got five or 10 grand now and you've got consumer debt and you don't have an emergency fund, you need to take care of that first. So that's where that would go. So if I had five or 10K and all that was covered, I think it would just be business. I'd back myself. So taking property as an example, I would use five or 10K personally to get training, uh, get training, either get coaching with someone doing it or pay for a membership like I did for eight, for 12 months and, and get involved and get in that environment. You know, the returns that you could potentially get on that are way greater than what you could get in the stock market or crypto or even property actually, like 10 grand isn't gonna get you very far. So that's what I would do. There's no better ROI than business. So, you know, it's more riskier, but, you know, the lessons that you learn when you train yourself in property now, like what I've done, I could take that with me forever. So that's just gonna keep returning for me for the rest of my life. Okay, next question. How did you start your side hustle? So I, I mentioned that uh, nothing more than I joined a course that was I think like $69 or something. I was very afraid of spending that money and wasting it. And this was in December 14. I gave it a go. I just followed the process. I, I trusted them what they did because they were earning like 10 to 20K a month. I thought, God, if I can get like 1,000 pound a month, that would be unbelievable. Like a 10th of what they can do. And you know, thankfully I was able to get those same returns in time, but I just trust the process. I followed what they told me. I, t I did my own take on it. I like, I think I tried to do it slightly better and um, it worked out for me, but uh, it's just about going with someone that you know, like, and trust and follow their process and go for it. If you can get referrals of people that you know that aren't incentivized to tell you to go and do it, then speak to them and see how they find it and just back yourself and go for it. Where do you dedicate your time daily and weekly? I mean, it's not super structured. It, there, there is some structure to it, but on a daily basis, like I'll wake up without an alarm. That's key. It might be five, 6 a.m. And then I'll work up until around midday and that is YouTube time. And I'll do that Monday to Saturday. Well, actually that's light. I, do, I get up first thing and then I walk. So it might be between 3,000 and 5,000 steps roughly. That's the very first thing that I do. And then um, I'll get into my YouTube work. That's like creative work. It's the hardest stuff. What I find is when I try and do script writing and stuff in the afternoon, it's just, I find it so difficult. I really struggle. The equivalent of doing that type, like I might spend two or three hours to do one hour's worth of work that I could do in the morning. It's just a waste of time for me. So morning's creative work, and that's what I recommend people should do, whatever their creative is. And then afternoons, try and focus on you know meetings, I do Zoom calls, networking, emails, transactional stuff like updating spreadsheets, all of that type of stuff later on. I switch off work for about five or 6 p.m. every day, depending on if Lou's working or not. And I try and keep the evening free uh, for me to do my own thing. If I'm working out, which I work out four days a week, I'll put that in the afternoon as well. That's a blocked out, that is a meeting for me, non-negotiable, it just gets done. And in the evening with Lou, we'll tend to have a little catch up. What we'll do, we might go for a walk, uh, do some puzzling, uh, and then we always finish with Netflix. We always finish with TV. I like to finish with comedy. So, you know, Parks and Recs, The Office US, Shit's Creek, Modern Family, we love all that stuff, a bit of silliness, watch two episodes or so, sometimes three, and then go to bed. Um, so that's my day. My week is basically, well, Monday to Saturday scripting, filming, Saturday, Sunday. Uh, Sunday I try to have off with Lou, but, so, but that's not always the case. Sometimes uh, I do work during it. In the afternoons I'll take care of property and then publishing, so I do my my weekly publishing catch-ups from 12 o'clock onwards and Wednesday's normally my property day but yeah it's quite loose as you can tell but that's my day and week thank you for your questions Hardy H this came in from Instagram and 
She's put, do you think crypto is just hype? If yes, why? If no, why? I would say, first of all, I'm not an expert on crypto. Like I'm invested in it. I've got over five figures in it, but I'm definitely not an expert. I would say yes and no. Do I think it's hype? Yeah, I mean, there are, I think, close to 20,000 coins now at the time of recording. And the vast majority of them are hyped up. They will have very little utility in people's lives and they'll be non-existent in five to 10 years. That's honestly what I believe for what it's worth. Uh, however, within those 20,000, there are some life-changing technology that's included. And if you, I will be doing a video on crypto. It has been uh, requested by a number of people and I will be doing one because I've got some views on it. And like Bitcoin, Ethereum, you know, you're probably going to be your safest bet if you're entering it for the first time. And I'll do, they're very different as well. Uh, and I'll talk about that. But smart contracts, Web 3.0, NFTs, they're going to change the world, the technology on those alone. So I think it's a good play to understand the basics of this and to be involved and invested in it. But you have to be wary of the hype. And I have recently, just to give you an idea of the time of recording, I had... $12,000 in UST, US Tether, uh, Terra, sorry, US Terra. And Terra and Luna have basically crashed and they're gonna go to zero. So I have effectively, like I, I've, I was able to salvage a very small proportion. And this was supposed to be a trusted stable coin, one that's um, fairly secure. I know a lot of people have been stung by this, but it was manipulated. There was a bit of like kind of corruption and you read the stories behind it, it's terrible, but that's the thing. Crypto is unregulated. That's one of the appeals. Like it's not, the government haven't got their dirty mitts on it and like printing money and doing all these things. But unfortunately, because it's not regulated, you have some not very nice people as well, or some very rich, not very nice people manipulating the market to get an extra few quid. And it's ruining a lot of people. So um, look, crypto is worth understanding, get the basics. And I think if you just did a Bitcoin and Ethereum and just tried to learn, you know, to put a little bit in, put no more than 5% of your total net worth. So if you've got 100K, like leave it at 5K. Don't be messing around more than that because it's way too volatile. But I think if you're ignorant to the fact, you're going to miss out. And crypto is like the internet in the 90s. So if you think, like we know it's going to be a big deal, but we don't know really what are going to be the big players, what are the big coins. So if you think about the 90s, like who's going to be the Amazon, the Facebook, the Google? like of the crypto, like who's gonna be the smart contract leader, the NFT leader, all of that type of thing. We're still working that out. It might be Bitcoin and Ethereum and they may, you know, not be with us in 10 or 20 years. No one really knows. So that's the interesting thing. Like be in the game, understand it, keep your ear to the ground and just see where the players are and put only money into crypto that you're prepared to lose and you'll be okay. I wasn't happy about losing 12 grand, but it hasn't changed my lifestyle either. It's fucking annoying, but I'm, you know, it's not gonna affect me in any way at the same time. If no, how long will it take crypto to be normal and frequently use currency? God, that's a, I mean, it's a really big question. Governments want to regulate it and control it. And that's what a lot of the coins are against in the first place. So I think regulation is gonna be the biggest hurdle to, to overcome. And I, and I don't know how close they are to that, to be honest. Like we've witnessed with Luna and Terra, it's just, it, it's too open for corruption and manipulation at the moment. Like they have laws in the stock market for things you can and can't do. So if you're a director of a company, you can't kind of give advice out. It's insider trading stuff. None of that seems to exist in crypto. So it's the wild west. It's like what stocks and shares used to be like. So until there's some more regulation in place, I think it's gonna be very difficult. Uh, but as I mentioned, smart contracts, NFTs and Web 3.0, that's moving ahead anyway. That's already happening. I don't know if that answers your question, but. Thank you for leaving your question. Okay, Ethan Power, maybe the greatest name on the planet. What's the simplest way to start investing in property? Specifically, more passive, less effort, less risk. Okay, uh, fair enough, Ethan. The mo so the most hands-off passive approach is probably gonna be giving your money to an investor, like someone like me or another property investor that you know that's doing it. What I do with investors is they'll give us a lump sum figure, like we've done one recently, like someone gave us six figures. We use that money to put into our development the development cost to transform it. If we didn't have that money, we would go to a bridging firm. And bridging is just bridging the gap from, you know, a mortgage won't lend the money to do a development like that. So you go to an expensive bridging company who charge like 10 to 15% a year to borrow that money. So you'll get it quickly and it's very useful, but it's expensive. So we will pass on those returns to an investor. So we'll maybe pay them six or 8% instead. So we get to save between say eight and 10, eight and 12%. And if you're borrowing a hundred grand, 
If you're saving 2% or 4%, that's two or four grand a year. That's a decent saving. Uh, and that's on 100,000. You may be spending, you know, half a million. So that soon adds up. Yeah, the investor, because they because it's a loan agreement, they will get the first dibs on it. So if our property, like the Anvil, for example, it was due to be 365K, but it came out as 400K, which is awesome, right? So that meant we got all of our money back plus profits on top. Fabulous, awesome. But if what happened if it worked the other way and it was worth 330 instead? Well, the money that I'd initially put in to purchase it would be locked up in there. So I would just have to, you know, I'd only have some of my money back, not all of it. And the investor would still get paid immediately, plus their interest on top once we've refinanced it. So you're invested in property. It's secure because you've got a first charge on a property. You get your money back guaranteed, plus your interest. It's nice and passive, and we'll give them a 6 or 8% return. So that's the easiest thing. You don't have to worry about anything. You just need to trust the person you're working with. And that, that, is, that is obviously a big factor, but that's probably the easiest, most passive way in. Otherwise you find someone like I found in, in Martin, like a, a joint venture partner who you know, like and trust, and you go in on the deal and you joint venture. So you own the asset with them at the end. The downside to that is you're taking on the risk. If the valuation doesn't come through, and there are unforeseen circumstances, like I've had in our second development, like 20Ks worth of unforeseens, then there might be more money left in the deal. And that's, you know, it's a joint risk, joint reward. So the loan is more guaranteed, but you get a smaller return. The joint venture, you get a better return, but you have to take on the risk as well. And you, you have to have more than likely more money behind you as well to be able to do that. Simple way forward for crypto. Well, I've kind of mentioned crypto a little bit earlier, so I'd do no more than 5% of the money that you have and your, your total net worth. And I think, again, not financial advice, but if you're looking around Bitcoin and Ethereum and you split that down the middle, you won't go far too far wrong and just get on with your life. And then if you say you got a spare grand every month, just to keep things real simple, then you can put, you know, 50 to 100 quid a month into your crypto. So put like 50 quid each Bitcoin and Ethereum and the other 900 quid in some other area. That's 10%, so I wouldn't be doing that continually, but just as a, like a rough guide. Just try not to overthink it or time the market. Just keep doing it on a regular basis when you're paid. If you have zero savings, where do you start? You know, go and get some, sell stuff, rent stuff, work extra hours, uh, get a side hustle, get money coming in. Yeah, that's really gotta be your focus. Like business, like I mentioned earlier, 80% of your time is getting money in. It's the same thing, you've got no savings. You need to go and get some. Like we've all got stuff that we don't use. We can rent out space, work extra hours, pick up extra work. So just do what you can to get started to get a few quid in. What are my thoughts on pensions? Are pensions worth it? Do I recommend any? Is it better to focus on investing in other things? So that is a great question. And in the UK, it's going to differ obviously wherever we're based. But if your company has a, a matching scheme, you know, like when I worked back at my sales job, I put 2% in and they would put 5% in. So you want to max that out. That makes total sense to do that. So you've got like kind of company pension stuff and you've got then your personal pension stuff. So that, that's very different. Like I'd recommend you wholeheartedly do what you can on the company pension front. With regards to personal pensions, I think it really does depend on a few things. So as a general rule of thumb, the older you are and the more money you have, then the more you want to think about prioritizing pensions. So let's use some examples. If you're you know, over 40 or 50 and you can pull your money out at 55 or it will be 57 in 2028, you know you're going to have access to that. But however, if you're a teenager or you're 20 and, you put it, and you're piling all the money you earn, you're putting into a pension, well, I'm sorry to say this, but it's the truth. You may not make it to 55 or 65. And when you get closer to 55, they might just push the goalpost out to 60, 70. You may not ever get it. So for me, I always prioritize the ISA because I can pull that money out. And that's more important to me is access rather than some of the tax benefits you have. But um, company scheme, definitely. Focus on filling your ISAs, getting businesses up and running now. That will be where most of the money goes. And if you have excess profit after that, then I'd be looking at doing pension stuff. And if you have a business, which is, again, I keep making this point, but it needs reiterating, get a business. Get involved in business, even a side one, because all the tax benefits that you can have. And you can start paying yourself. So when my money comes into to publishing um, a business, I then transfer over to my personal pension, and I can write that off as an expense to keep my corporate tax down. 
You know, so I'm just paying myself extra money for free and then I get the tax benefits on the other side. It's, it's just a no brainer, um, but don't prioritize it over other things when you're younger and you have less money. So our house is worth 450K. Does it make more sense to sell it, downsize and invest the difference or to continue climbing up the ladder? Financially wise, which is the best option? Really, it, like it's gonna depend on your goals. So if you wanna be financially independent as soon as possible, then you're probably gonna wanna sell up downsize, ideally like downsize and go into an area that's slightly cheaper as well, if you can do that. And maybe you can retire immediately. Like really, if you go to a small house in a, a slightly cheaper area, you might be able to be financially independent or well on your way. And you can use that chunk of money to then invest it into property or um, stocks and shares. If your goal is to maximize profits, then what I say on the property front is, you know, work on your own house first, like extend, make, make the floor space as big as possible. Like, can you go out to the side, to the back? Um, can you go up another level? Uh, improve the kitchens, bathrooms, uh, living areas. And um, then if you can sell that and then do it two or four times, you can really rack up a huge amount of money. So it depends on, you know, you wanna get out of your job quickly, I downsize. If you're looking to maximize profit, then use your house as an experiment to, to um, invest and sell a, a number of times. My wife is a great saver, but she doesn't maximize her money. What would you recommend that she do with her excess cash? Reiterating a lot of the points that I've made earlier. Look, as long as you've got three to six months living expenses as emergency funding cash that you can access very quickly, I think that's sufficient personally. Now, if you run your own business or you're in a very volatile or, 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 or unknown business area where you don't know what the future holds for it, if it's a new company, for an example, you might want a little bit more cash behind you, maybe six to 12 months. It needs to pass the sleep test. So whatever makes you comfortable at night, then go with that. And anything above that level, which you've predetermined, then you need to get that going. And I think the first place to go is in a side business and back yourself and get training in an area. Yeah, that's what I would do with my excess cash. But I'm, you know, when I started, I had one month's worth of expenses and I went full steam into, uh, you know, my business, my uh, publishing business. I wouldn't recommend doing that. Not great, but I'm risking, like, I'm like, yeah, f it. I, I back myself, I'll make this work. But for anyone else, three to six months is more than enough. Six to 12 is probably overkill, you know, but that's more than that. If you've got more than 12, then get that money going for you. Buying investment property in your personal name versus a limited company. Wow, okay. This is a great question. And I think I might do a, a separate video on the kind of tax implication of property, but okay, I've just looked at this. The personal allowance in the UK is 12,500. I knew it was like 12K or something. So you can earn 12,570 tax-free. Okay, if you earn up to 50,000, I think it's 270, your class is a basic rate taxpayer. So you pay nothing for the first 12 and a half. Then if you go up to 50 grand, then you pay 20%. If you go over that, then you pay 40%. So if you are earning less than 50 grand, then it makes sense to maximize property in your personal name for tax reasons, okay? For tax reasons alone. So with 20, uh, section 24, in 2020, it went it went live, okay? It was phased in from 2017. Prior to tech, section 24, you could write off your mortgage interest rates as an expense. You, you can do that in any other business. You can always write off your expenses. But with tw section 24, you could only do that up to 20%. So if you are at a higher rate taxpayer, paying 40% tax, you could only claim half of that back on your interest mortgage payments. So what does all this mean? You know, I probably haven't explained that brilliantly, but if you're a basic rate taxpayer and you're earning less than 50, then you can earn property income in your personal name up to 50K and, it's pro and it is more tax efficient than going for a company. If you're already earning 50K and above, then you're way better off from a tax perspective to put that into a limited company. And you can do both. You can start to get up to 50K once you hit that, do everything else in a company. I don't know if that's answered your question, but I personally uh, just do it in a company. But actually from a tax perspective, it's good to kind of play both. Where is the best place to invest in property? UK possible hotspots, <laughs> okay. So where is the secret place to invest in? The answer that everyone wants to know. Look, where you wanna go, is you wanna buy low and sell high but no one wants to buy low, that's the crux of it. But if you know somewhere is fairly low, but is going to be high, so you know, you know, if you look at the council, so in, in, we're in Cambridge, so if we go to Cambridge Council and look at their programs and what their infrastructure guides are, what, what, are they, what money are they gonna put into the area? You can kind of work out which areas are gonna be elevated. So if they're gonna be putting two million into this certain area, they'll be doing these new blocks of building blocks or like supermarkets, schools, hospitals, then, 
it's very likely that in that time frame, the house prices are going to go up higher. You can do some of that research in your local um, authorities, wherever you're based, and look at the surrounding areas. But the other thing I'd mention as well is that, you know, how are you going to feel about traveling to that place? If you look at somewhere and it's three hours away, like, oh, this is a great hotspot, I really want to go there, like Liverpool, Nottingham, Leeds, Sheffield, you know, and all of those are like big bustling cities that are going to like, you know, that reputedly are great places to invest. But how do you feel about traveling there? What about if your tenant has issues? What about managing the refurb? These are all things you've got to think about. So I think there's something to be said. It's not just about buying in a location which is going to return well. How does that, how does owning that asset in that area uh, feel for you? So personally, I don't want to be on the road for loads of hours. I invest two hours away. I'm kind of fine with that, but I would not invest that far away if I didn't have Martin. So that's a yeah, massive key. And actually the area that we invest in is his hometown. It's in that surrounding area. So he knows all the areas in the boroughs. So um, he knows what's good and what isn't. You know, we're kind of leveraging that knowledge. There's a lot to be said about what you know. I think there's another general rule of thumb. You're probably within 30 to 45 minutes away from a decent area. And, you know, try and find that within you rather than the UK hotspot. How to calculate ROI and creating a spreadsheet on returns as a percentage. Probably better if I do a video on this. You, you could definitely just Google how to calculate ROI into YouTube and Google uh, and, and you'll get an answer on that. But basically, if you have your rent, you minus the mortgage costs of that, which you can, uh, which will be, you'll be borrowing 75% of the value of the property. So a hundred grand property, your mortgage will be 75 grand. Have a look at a five-year fix on, say, Money Supermarket and what are the rates on a five-year fix. That will give you your guide. Yes, you can get it cheaper than that, but that's a nice safeguard that you can lock in and it will be that price, um, you know, 400 quid a month, whatever it is, for the next five years. And you know uh, that will be the case. Look for interest only as well. That's what you'll be doing for a buy to let. So you've got your rent coming in. How do you find your rent? Go to right move, rent. Put the postcode in of the houses that you're looking at or the rough areas go on the map and just check that it's a like for like so if you've got a two bed terrace that you're interested in look at two bed terraces as close as possible on that same street that postcode and see what they're renting for so your rent minus your mortgage costs then you've got 10 percent for maintenance so take 10 percent of your rent so if you're getting 500 quid a month you need 50 quid for maintenance. You need 50 quid roughly, 10% again, for management costs for someone to look after the tenant issues for you. And then you've probably got insurance. So insurance is gonna be like 20, 30 quid a month, something like that. Then you're gonna get your profit. So once you've got your profit number, it's that figure divided by the amount that you've invested in the first place to acquire it. So if you've got a 75% mortgage, you're gonna to have to put 25% in. So whatever, let's say it's 25K. So whatever your profit is divided by the 25K that you've put in, then times that by 100 to get a percentage. That's your ROI, okay? Hopefully that made sense. I'll probably do a video on it if, that, if that's uh, more helpful. Okay, and the final question from Steve. How to take equity out of a property you already own? Very straightforward, you remortgage it. So once your, re, uh, your mortgage is up for renewal, so if you've got a two year fix at that period, maybe six months just before, speak to your mortgage broker, see what deals are there, get a, uh, an estate agent to come out and you can get two or three, I'd recommend getting a few and just get them to price the house up. So if you know it's worth 400K, they come out and it's like, oh, this is worth like 450 now. You've got a 50 grand buffer maybe uh, of profit that you've made. Using that 75% percentage again, when you remortgage it and you extend your mortgage, then you'll be able to pull 75% of that profit out but you'll have to leave 25% in as the you know deposit. So what's that like 30, it'll be something like 37 and a half grand. It'll be something like that, that you'll be able to pull out as profit from 50K value going up. And I recommend everyone do that. Um, as long as you can afford the repayments and you can sleep at night, then it financially makes sense to do that. Especially if you can borrow for five years at 2% get that 37 and a half K and get it working for you, you know, get it into property, loan it to people, you know, I'll give you six to 8% for it. And that's, you know, you're paying two, I'll give you six to eight and that's passive. Never mind, you know, what you could do yourself by earning, um, you know, money in uh, a buy to let you can get like 10 percent, 20 percent. so hope that helps so that's it guys thanks for questions with you i hope that was useful and interesting it was a very different video to do this to sit down and just 
Um, you don't worry about all the flashy editing and scripts, just, just, just riff. Uh, so I hope there was some value in that. There will be some timestamps in the video, uh, which I should have probably said at the start, um, but there we go. Yeah, and if you've got any questions on my questions, just leave them in the comments below. As always, like the video, subscribe, help me get to a million subscribers so we can take over the world and become the biggest financial entertainment channel on YouTube, on the planet. Thank you for watching to this end. And if you're still watching, what are you doing watching right to the end? But yeah, thank you for your, for your support and your encouragement. And I will see you very soon.